Hi, St. John Fishers, Father John with another Friday video for you. I've shared with a couple of classes when I've been in to, uh, to do some sessions on vocations or sort of, uh, you know, ask Father John any questions you've got. I've shared with you how to use the Bible to prove that the world wasn't created literally in six days. So for those of you whose classes I haven't had the chance, uh, to get around and visit yet. I thought I'd share that with you. So we all know the story of creation according to the book of Genesis that God creates the world in six days and nights and then on the seventh day he rests and that gives us our, our seven day week pattern which fits in very nicely now with what we know about uh, the rotation of the earth and the orbit of the earth around the sun. We also know that you can use the Bible to prove or disprove anything you want if you take one or two lines out of context. So it's important to not only know what the Bible says, but also what it doesn't say, and also which bits to take literally and which bits not. The six days and nights thing we don't take literally for this reason. The difference between day and night doesn't come until day number four. So we have, you know, evening came, morning came the first day, evening came, morning came the fifth day, but it's not until day number four when we actually get God naming the day, day, and the night, night. So what came before that? Because it obviously wasn't a period of 24 hours as we understand it today. That's why the church understands that story of Genesis as a way of explaining the creation of the universe before we too, knew too much about the Big Bang and evolution and the formation of planetary bodies and all of that business. But yeah, if anyone ever does try and tell you that the world was created literally in six days, ask them what the days were before day number four when God called the light day and the darkness night, because it obviously wasn't a period of 24 hours as we understand it now. Now you can hopefully tell that uh, I'm sitting here in the pews uh, at Holy Trinity and once I've turned uh, the camera off uh, I'll be saying a few prayers for everybody while I'm here but um, I thought we would continue to explore our different postures and positions and gestures in Mass and I thought we would uh, look at why we sit in Mass today. We looked at standing last week and we know that we sit for our readings so we have start of Mass when we're standing, we have the penitential rite, the opening prayer, and then we sit for our first reading, our psalm. If it's a Sunday, there's a second reading. We stand again for the Gospel, and then we sit for the homily, and we sit to hear what Father's got to say about the Gospels. Well, there's a practical and a spiritual reason for sitting uh, during those readings and sitting in the homily. The practical reason, it relaxes us. We sit, we relax, we're not worrying about how uncomfortable we are, we're not worrying about our feet aching uh, or anything like that. We're sitting so we can listen to the stories from the Bible being told to us, we can listen to Father's homily trying to explain those stories from the Bible and make them seem relative to our own lives. We sit, we're attentive, same way that we sit in class, listen to the presentations being given to us, try and get our work done. We also think back to your own childhood when you would sit uh, for bedtime stories or sit for mum and dad or grandparents or whatever to read stories to you. We sit to relax and take things on board, take on board the stories. That book I recommended to you before, The Spirit of the Liturgy by Pope Benedict. It's got a great passage about practical reasons for sitting in Mass. Sitting should be at the service of our recollection. Our bodies should be relaxed so our hearts and understanding are unimpeded. We sit practically, we're relaxed, we can take on board as much of the Bible readings as are being given to us and try and take on board as much of Father's homily as we possibly can. And then also, in the same way that standing we're sharing in Jesus' stance as a victor. Sitting, we're sharing in the work of the disciples. 
with it taking the place of the disciples. We think of the twelve apostles sat at the table at the Last Supper, you know, sitting with Jesus. We also think uh, of that story of Martha and Mary, with Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him speak. That's where we get the expression to sit at the feet of the Master. So we sit, much like any other disciple, we sit at the feet of the Master, we sit at the feet of Jesus, we sit and take on board his teachings and the explanations given to us uh, by our priest. So hopefully that unpacks for you a little bit uh, of why we sit in Mass. And I'll say a little more um, about everything in the build-up to Easter as we approach the holidays, but just to flag up, you know, it would be lovely to see lots of you at the Easter Vigil. So that's the Saturday before Easter Sunday. Um, it's a, a long service, but it's a beautiful service, and the first half is done in the darkness by candlelight. It's absolutely wonderful service to be a part of. We're, do, we're starting that at, uh, at 7 p.m. here at Holy Trinity uh, on the Saturday before Easter Sunday. So just to, uh, to flag that up for you, church starting off in darkness and then the light gradually spreading across the church just as, as the light of Jesus, the light of Christ spreads out uh, throughout this darkened world. It'll be wonderful to see a few of you uh, at 7 p.m. on Holy Saturday uh, to come be with us in darkness in the church and welcome uh, the light of the world, welcome Jesus into our lives once more at Easter. So I'll remind you of all that the nearer we get to the holidays. Uh, for the time being, see you all in school and see you at Mass on the Sunday. God bless. Bye bye.